we've got. All right. It sure is good to see everyone this morning. Glad we can be together and study God's Word. We're going to continue Revelation in just a moment here. Going to get into some uh, more interesting stuff, kind of leading uh, further into the Exodus stuff from last week. Uh, but uh, it is, again, so good to see everyone. Glad that we can uh, enjoy this time of fellowship together. Let's start off with a prayer, and then we'll get into it. Dear Father, thank you so much for everything that you have done for us. Father, as we are here together today, uh, it's just another reminder that we have so many blessings, Father. Lord, there are brethren around the world who do not have the support, do not have the, the comfort of knowing that there are other like-minded believers nearby who can offer them strength and, and comfort in difficult times. But Father, we, in this community, in this part of the country, we have so many brethren around us that uh, we can rely on, that we can learn from, that we can encourage and be encouraged by. And Father, that is just such a blessing. Lord, as we are coming here to, to study, to worship, to praise you, Lord, we cannot properly express how much we want to thank you and praise you for all that you have done and all that you are. But Lord, we do ask that as we dive into your word, that we may gain a better appreciation not only for you, but for what you expect from us. Lord, we know that there are many who are going through difficulties right now. We pray that you would be with them. Father, we ask that you would... Uh, especially continue to be with uh, Larry and Helen as they'll be traveling back soon. And I pray that Larry may continue to recover well. Uh, Father, we just know that there are many others who are uh, going through difficulties, uh, mindful Daryl as well, as he'll have surgery soon. Uh, Lord, we, uh, we want to be servants to those around us who are going through difficulties, and we ask that we may look for those opportunities, uh, and that we may shine uh, your glory out in the world. Father, we ask that you would please forgive us for our sins, and that you would help us as we're striving to grow. And Father, we pray all these things in the name of Jesus, through whom we have all hope. Amen. All right. You remember last week, we were in Revelation 15. And as we look through Revelation 15, and this is something I didn't realize until this round of study in Revelation, basically everything in that chapter although it is talking about something specific for the audience that John's writing to, it's alluding back to the imagery of Exodus, especially the imagery of the Red Sea and then the tabernacle. We have essentially this uh, picture of God's people uh, gathered around that large basin that is uh, in the tabernacle. And of course, this is a figure. This isn't literally the basin, but uh, they are gathered around this basin as judgment is prepared or being prepared uh, for those who have rejected God's people and persecuted God's people. Uh, the basin is filled with not only clear water, but also fire, a representation of judgment. You have these seven angels who are coming out of the sanctuary where the presence of God is. They are given seven bowls. These represent judgment. And so all of this, you're preparing for this idea of these bowls being poured out. Again, a reference back to the Old Testament, as you would have the wine being poured out as a symbol of judgment. And so you have all of these figures as we're building up to judgment, while at the same time, the saints, those who have remained faithful during the suppression, are standing in the court of the tabernacle, near God's presence, if you will, and they are singing a song that essentially echoes back to Israel's song of deliverance at the Red Sea. So that's where we got to. We were uh, looking through this chapter. It's essentially the prequel chapter, if you will, to this section of Revelation, and now we're going to see the angels begin to pour out these judgments that they have. So Revelation 16 is where we'll be. We'll be looking at the first 11 chapters, continuing this idea of plagues, which once again should bring to our minds the idea of Exodus. We're still using the figures from Exodus, and as we're going to see, very explicitly doing so now with some of the ten plagues, although not all of them. We're going to use seven in this case, and some of them even are going to overlap, which will be interesting. So starting in verse 1, Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Now just as we get started, I want to point out something interesting here. We just mentioned in the last chapter that we're using a lot of this imagery from Exodus. 
And explicitly, some of the imagery from Exodus talks about the tabernacle and the things that were done in the tabernacle. But it also refers to that basin with the language that was used in Solomon's temple. Now, notice what we have. We have from what? Not the tabernacle, from the temple, this voice comes. What does that tell us? If it's referred to as a tabernacle in chapter 15, and now it's being referred to as a temple, using the exact same imagery, we haven't moved, we haven't changed scenes, what does that tell us? It's coming from God. The, the symbol is still the presence of God, but he's very intentionally switching up his language we're not trying to talk about anything physical, anything literal. I know we belabor that point in this class, right? But he can't talk about the same place, the same structure as a tabernacle and a temple if we're talking about anything physical. It has to be a representation not of anything about the tabernacle or the temple itself, but about what it represents. Hebrews goes into a whole lot of detail, right? Uh, this idea of all of those things in, in Exodus and in the book, the Law of Moses, all those things are representations of something spiritual. They're copies of the true, as the Hebrews writer would say. So we're not trying to nail down some of these fine points in terms of anything physical. Like Andy said, this is the idea of presence. God's presence dwelt in both the tabernacle and the temple, and that's the point. The loud voice from the temple, well, whose voice is that? It's God's voice, and that's what we're trying to take away from this. So God instructs these seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. Now, it's interesting. Uh, you almost kind of get a, an image when we hear that of, uh, I think this is still the, the um, oh, what are they called? Not the emblem. What's what's a business has uh, like a, a picture that represents them? What's that called? Logo. Thank you. I think it's still the logo of Sherwin Williams, with the paint can being poured out over a globe. Y'all seen that? Y'all familiar with that? That's kind of what I imagine when I read this. Right? Go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls. They're taking a bowl and they're pouring it out. But there's a problem with that, isn't there? We've already talked about it a few times before. What does earth refer to in the book of Revelation and really in several books in, in Scripture? Does it refer to a planet? No. It refers to land as opposed to sea. That's generally, and especially in Revelation because there's symbolism involved, how they would use that word, because they don't have the concept of how big the world is, whether they think of it as a planet or whatever they thought of it in the ancient times. They're thinking in terms of earth versus sea. Again, going even back to Genesis, right? He divides the water and has dry land appear. One is earth, one is sea. So when we say, go pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God, what is he specifically saying that the angels are to target when they pour out these bowls of wrath. Earth. Do what? The inhabited earth. Ah, the inhabited earth. Very good. And specifically, as we're going to see, a big part of this is targeted not just at the inhabited earth in general, but at earth where these Christians are. Meaning, the area they're in, in particular, is going to feel the wrath of God, although the empire itself will as well. And we'll get to that in just a second. I want us to be thinking in those terms. So let's start with, then, in verse 2, with the first angel. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Okay. We're going to see the bowls are poured out in different places that are specified as we move forward. But the first one goes right along with verse 1, he pours his bowl out on the earth. Now, I want to give a caveat here, right? You're going to find all sorts of different interpretations of what these symbols and what these bowls mean. And I don't just mean all the people that just go crazy with interpretation of Revelation. I mean people who actually have basically the right sense of what this book is about, how the symbolism works. You're still going to find people who disagree about this. So I want to put that out there up front. 
I think these are very defend defensible uh, explanations for uh, what these symbols mean, what we're going to talk about today. But I do want to say there is debate about that. But when we follow the context, when we follow the imagery we've used so far, he pours his bowl out on the earth. We're talking essentially about the bowl being poured out on the people living in the area where John is writing to, Asia, the province of Asia, who have been persecuting the Christians. He's pouring it out on the inhabited area where these Christians have been suffering. And notice, harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. Ring any bells? What is this referring to? It could be leprosy. We don't know exactly what the sores were, but we know that there were sores that were inflicted upon the Egyptians, and not only on the people, if you go back to Exodus, even the beasts... Uh, their, their livestock even had these sores uh, that came upon them. I think some translations may call them boils, uh, but they had this as one of the ten plagues that occurred in Exodus. And so we have, again, pulling from this imagery, we have sores coming upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped this image. Mark of the beast, we've already talked about a lot. This is essentially, whether we're talking about the forehead or the excuse me, the right hand, both of those we have described, either one, we have, in some sense, ownership by Rome, worship of the Roman gods, uh, you know, giving in to the pressure to worship the Roman gods. It's all kind of the idea. And worshiping its image, certainly, we have going back to worshiping the representation of Rome, whether that be the goddess Roma or the imperial cult, either one representing Rome as a whole, and that was a big part of the pressure in Asia that you were supposed to worship. So basically we're saying this judgment is targeted at the people who have either compromised or who just aren't Christians at all and are participating in this because that's what society is doing. They are going to suffer some kind of judgment, some kind of suffering, some kind of pain, some kind of punishment. What exactly is that? Well, it's not literal sores, right? We're using that imagery from Exodus. There's going to be some kind of suffering that is inflicted upon the people in Asia who have been pressuring God's people in Asia. We're not given exactly what that is. We're just being told some form of judgment is coming that this group of people specifically is going to suffer. Now, we also want to note, even if you are a Christian in name, but you have compromised, you're still included in this. You still get the sores too. Again, that's a figure. But you still get this judgment too. Either way, whether you just do this because this is your culture and you've never even thought about becoming a Christian, or you're a Christian and you've gone back into the world, this is what happens. You only are with the saints around the basin singing for uh, you know victory over uh, of God's deliverance if you haven't compromised in the first place. So we have this idea then, anyone who has participated in the imperial cult, anyone who's been pushing the imperial cult, anybody who has in any way persecuted Christians because of this worship of Rome, of the cults, of all these kind of things, well, you're going to suffer in some way. There's going to be judgment. We keep on going. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea, different location, and it became like the blood of a corpse, and every living thing died that was in the sea. All right, so if the earth, God is going to specifically judge those who are in Asia who have been persecuting Christians, and by the way, we're going to come back to what some of these things might be more specifically in a sense, but if that's the earth... What is the sea? Ah, everything else. I think it was in, was it chapter 13 or 14? We talked about this idea. If you are part of the province of Asia, you come over land to wherever you need to go within the province. If you're from Rome 
and you need to come and do business, you know, the empire sends a messenger to the government of Asia or something like that. Well, how do you get to Asia? Well, you cross the sea. The sea represents, and of course we're talking about the Mediterranean specifically, the sea represents the known world, it represents the empire, specifically because Rome is across the sea, it can represent Rome as a city, but really even more so just the empire itself. Now, that's the target this time, but notice the actual play. They pour the bowl into the sea, and it becomes like the blood of a corpse. Ring any bells? First plague, right? Water to blood. The blood of a corpse. Now, that doesn't actually go back to Exodus, meaning the corpse part. That's not how it's described in Exodus, if you remember. It just says it became blood. Why does he specify it's like the blood of a corpse in verse 30? Okay, good. There is some of this imagery of the sea becoming blood. I believe it was um, targeting the trade ships where uh, you have this idea of all of the, the trade ships of the empire are sunk or something like that. So yes, we have had that imagery before. Very good. Why the corpse, though? We're still, we're still coming back to this idea. And it could maybe relate to that, but I think we're, I think we're using something different for this image. Maybe we should put it this way. Why did the water turn to blood in Exodus? Why blood? Why not, I don't know, oil or tar? Or I, I, why blood? Ah, blood represents life. Blood can also represent the end of life. And in their case, you have a god specifically associated, an Egyptian god, specifically associated with the Nile. So what you essentially have is the domain of this god, one of the most important, if not the most important god in Egyptian religion. Well, their domain is now blood. <laughs> Right, so it just you you're bleeding the god dry essentially. They they don't have any control over their own domain. So that's the kind of symbolism they were using with Egypt. Well, you don't have that same kind of symbolism. Like, yeah, you have a god of the sea, but we're not really trying to target Poseidon specifically here. I don't think. The idea is the sea. Going back to your idea of life, the sea for Rome and the empire is the lifeblood of the empire. But now it's the blood of a corpse. Meaning, this plague is a representation of the death of the empire. Every living thing that was in the sea died. The idea is, not only are the Asians who are persecuting the Asian Christians, excuse me, the Asian Christians being punished, but the empire itself now, with the second plague, its death has at least begun and is ultimately decreed. So we have the immediate persecutors of God's people being punished. Now we have the system that has been enabling that persecution. It is now dying. We go back to, it's funny that Roddy mentioned that earlier, we go back to the same image that we use when the idea of the trade ships were, uh, was brought up earlier in the book. Again, you don't have a Roman Empire in the way that it functioned and the way that it prospered without the sea. The sea that connects everything, the sea that allows for trade, the sea that allows for transportation. The Romans, by the way, mainly by stealing from the Carthaginians before them, but nonetheless became experts at naval warfare. 
uh, both because they uh, figured out how to build ships with good rams. At certain points, they would build uh, these amazing like gangways that would essentially, as soon as the ship got close to them, they just board the ship and kill everybody. It's like, okay, we're done, right? But uh, they became experts at this kind of warfare. So there was really no competition on the sea against them. Nobody could destroy Rome's power over the sea in terms of their naval control. They, that allows for all these trade ships to happen. That allows for them to very quickly move armies from one place to another. Well, as we're targeting the sea in this imagery, again, the idea is we're going to essentially cut the heart of the empire itself. Now, again, that doesn't mean literally some disaster is going to happen in the Mediterranean Sea. The idea is the immediate persecutors and the system that is enabling that persecution are both being judged, are both going to have some kind of disaster, some kind of uh, destruction happen to them as we are uh, moving towards the deliverance of God's people. The third angel poured out his into the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. Now, we just did this, right? <laughs> Why are we having blood again? We just did turning water to blood. Of course, this isn't the sea. This is the rivers, but still, why this? Why rivers and springs of water? What, what significance do those have? Ah, uh, the sea connects the empire, so in that sense, it allows for the life of the empire. But specifically, moving back to Asia for a moment, where do you build a city in the ancient world? You build it by some source of fresh water, either a river or a spring, usually a river, because that allows for more water than the average spring. But there were some major springs, for example, those that Laodicea got their water from. We talked about that all the way back in chapter 3, right, with the hot and cold, you're neither hot nor cold. So the rivers, the springs of water, every single one of these seven cities that uh, are addressed in chapters two and three was either by a river or a spring, and that would be true for most cities in the empire, most ancient cities total. And now, not only are we targeting the empire as a whole, not only are we targeting the individuals who are participating in this, in the first bowl, the first plague, but now, we're targeting the cities themselves that have made themselves enemies of God's people. And notice, I heard the angel in charge of the waters. So this angel pours out the bowl on the springs and the rivers. They turn to blood, and then he has something to say about it, unlike these first two angels. Just are you, O Holy One, who is and who was, for you brought these judgments for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. And I heard from the altar saying, Yes, Lord God, the Almighty, true and just are your judgments. <clears throat> A couple things here. Number one, what is the angel expressing for us? In light of what these people, these cities in Asia have done to God's people, what is the angel giving us in return? Justice. justice. And not just justice. <laughs> Didn't even intend that, right? Not just justice. It's poetic justice. It is being given to us as a, how ironic, in the most intentional of senses. This figure is being used because, literally, it is a reversal of what has already happened. In a literal sense, literal blood of Christians has been shed. So now, in creating the imagery for the judgment that is going to come on these cities, well, we're going to use the same thing, but back on their own heads. Not only that, but again, going off of this idea of justice, what is going to happen? We were actually talking, a couple of us talking about this before church. What is going to happen if you have God being, I'm going to use this from 
the perspective of someone who's not a Christian. What if you have God being blamed for all of these terrible things that are about to happen to the Roman Empire? I mean, think about Nero with the fire of Rome, right? What does he need? He needs a scapegoat. He needs someone to blame. So who does he blame? Well, the Christians are easy targets. So Nero starts persecuting Christians. It was mainly in the city of Rome, but still, he starts persecuting the Christians who are in Rome because you need a scapegoat. Well, what happens if enough people hear, oh, it was the God of the Christians who did this to us, as the empire starts tumbling down around them, as people start dying, quite literally, well, what's the response going to be? Anger at the Christians, and what an un how could you serve a God who would do such an unjust thing as to kill this many people? And so you have an expression here, as we're really starting to lean into this judgment, a lot of blood, right? We've already seen with the wine press in chapter 14, the wine press being poured out and blood runs for almost 200 miles up to a horse's bridle. This is a very bloody judgment. And so we're going to stop here for just a moment. Not only is this actually justice, not injustice, not only is this due punishment and not undue cruelty, but we're defending the fact God is doing this and he is not acting in any way wrongly. He is acting according to true character, true honor. Remember, the Romans care a lot about honor. The Romans care a lot about justice. And they think they have that all figured out. But just like everything else in the book of Revelation, Jesus is sending a message, no, they don't actually understand what true justice is. I'm going to show them what true justice is because they have been unjust, and not just unjust, violently unjust against my people. So we have now this targeting of the cities specifically with the rivers and the springs because, as was already mentioned, this is how those cities survive. How long can thousands of people survive without a source of fresh water? I mean, you let it go for five days without any fresh water at all, we're done, right? whole city becomes a ghost town. Well, that's the situation that we're being given here again, this figure of justice. All right. The fourth angel. The fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it immediately evaporated because the sun is so hot now. The fourth, bowl, or the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. See what we've just done? He said they're going to curse God, that happens in the fourth angel, so we made sure with the third angel to clarify before we get this backlash, you know, God's just in doing this, even though you know people are going to blame him for it. So, they were scorched by the fierce heat. They cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give him glory. Okay? Fire. We already had that fire mingled with the glass in the basin in the last chapter. What does fire represent, typically, in the book of Revelation? Can we represent purifying? Good. What else? Just New Testament in general, when you think fire, what do you think? Destruction, judgment, hell. Fire is typically the instrument of judgment in some way, especially when we're going to some kind of figurative language. So we have a judgment-type imagery being given here. Well, we certainly associate fire with final judgment. Is there any way we can know we haven't moved from specific judgment of Rome to final judgment in the fourth bowl and the fourth angel. Is there any way we can know this is or isn't final judgment? Man, I'm going to air horn next time. Wake y'all up. 
How can we know whether or not this is final judgment that this figure is referring to with the fourth angel? They didn't repent. There's not the option to repent if we're talking about final judgment. Final judgment is not one last attempt to get people to repent. Final judgment is you had your chance, we're done. This can't be final judgment because they have the option to repent and they choose not to. So what we're talking about, once again, it is judgment, but now we're talking with a different figure about this idea of God Using the sun, a very universal, right? There's no place on earth that doesn't get touched by the sun. A very universal phenomena. And anyone who is vulnerable, which again would be the people who have the mark of the beast, who are following after Rome, who are part of this system that is oppressing the people of God, they are going to be judged. They are going to experience this judgment, this punishment, scorched by the fierce heat. And their response, they curse God. They don't repent. They don't give him glory. You think about how many times in the period where Rome is falling and falling and falling until it eventually is no more. Think about how many times historically the empire could have pulled a Nineveh, right? Said, huh, maybe we're doing something wrong here. We keep on trying and trying and trying to make our empire better. We keep on trying and trying and trying to blame the Christians for all things that are going wrong. Maybe we're taking the wrong tactic. In fact, that's ultimately part of why Constantine would eventually make Christianity essentially the official religion of the empire. It was for political reasons. Let's not deceive ourselves into thinking Constantine was in any way a pious person, because he was not. But... His ultimate reasoning behind that was we've been beating our heads against the Christians for so long and accomplishing nothing. Maybe we should harness their potential to get them on our side, and it'll help us politically instead. Of course, that didn't save, save Rome in the end because that still wasn't the right response. But we see the idea here. Rome had so many chances with the gospel spread throughout the empire that as they continue to decline— in the decades after John writes this, they still don't repent. They still don't get it. And therefore, again, using this very, not just universal imagery, but very dramatic imagery, right? We have the sea turning to blood. Can you imagine if we woke up tomorrow morning and every news station was showing us the Mediterranean Sea and the entire thing was blood? I mean, that's dramatic, and we see stuff like that it, depicted in, like, movies and stuff. You know, you can actually demonstrate something on that scale in some kind of visual. Well, they didn't even have that kind of technology to kind of look at it in a, a very uh, visual way, right? And so now we're using the same thing with the sun and this idea of judgment with fire. All right. Last one we'll look at this morning. The fifth angel. The sixth and seventh ones are a lot longer, so we're going to stop here. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They did not repent of their deeds. All right. Now we have a very different target. The throne of the beast. That's where the bowl is poured out. Who's the beast? We've already established this in the last few chapters. Rome. Where's the throne of the beast? The city of Rome, right? Not Rome just as a whole, but now we're talking about the throne. We're going to the very heart of the problem, right? We've been targeting, and I say we, God has been targeting through these plagues mainly the people in Asia who have specifically been persecuting Christians, he's sowing the seeds for the death of the empire as a whole in the second plague. But now with this fifth plague, he's specifically targeting Rome itself. And notice, starting with the throne of the beast and reaching out to his entire kingdom, it is plunged into darkness. 
Ring any bells? Ninth plague, right? If I'm remembering correctly. Ninth plague, darkness spreads all over the land of Egypt, pulling from the same idea. Now, for them, it was interesting. Darkness spread all over the land of Egypt, but guess where wasn't dark? The land of Goshen, where the Israelites were. Darkness spreads all over the Roman Empire, but guess where you can still find a bright spot? With God's people. So why darkness? Why does this image fit for the judgment that's going to come on Rome and spread out? Hmm. Good, good. You can't do much without light, right? You know, you're stumbling around in the darkness. That's a very good part of this. Uh, when you think about what Rome, and especially Romans, thought they were contributing to the world, what did they think they had done for the world? And to some extent, what had they done for the world? They had enlightened it. They had raised its standard of living. They had uh, brought its civilization to a new brink. We talked about last week. There is a very good argument to be made that there has not, before or after, existed an empire like Rome in the world that accomplished the things it accomplished on the scale that it accomplished it. And all that is going to be brought from what they would see, to borrow some other metaphor, as a city on a hill, going to be brought down into utter darkness. In no way am I suggesting this is the reason for this name. However, I find it interesting. Anyone know what the time period after the fall of Rome is called? The Dark Ages. Again, I'm not suggesting that is somehow a prophecy of that in, in verse 11 or anything like that. But that is what happened ultimately. Just in terms of civilization itself, the world was plunged into darkness. And notice again the response. People nod their tongues in anguish. They already have the sores, right? They nod their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. They're not repenting, they're just lashing out more. Opposite of Nineveh, again, right? They did not repent of their deeds. And if we want to look at the aftermath, what is left of the Roman Empire? A few stones and a lot of destruction. So, as we see these plagues progressing, remember, he says in chapter 15, this is the final expression of judgment. This is the final set of seven symbols of judgment that we're going to see. And so as we're beginning to look at them in specific ways, God assured his people he would bring judgment on all involved in their oppression, from those who compromised to Rome itself and everyone in between. Now, historically, we can look. That came in the form, in some cases, of natural disasters. That came in the form of invasions, came in the form of disease, came in the form of uh, political turmoil, civil war. But however we want to lay all that out, the point is, as we look in history, God did, in fact, bring the province of Asia and Rome as a whole to its knees. And that ultimately was a punishment, as John is revealing for us here, for what they did to God's people. Any questions or comments before we close for this morning?